Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're all keeping safe and well. Welcome to the January 2021 GFM Talk session. I always start each of the GFM Talk session by reminding colleagues about the purpose of GFM Talks, and that's to welcome colleagues from across the GFM and schools within our local area so that colleagues can share their practice, their experiences and their thoughts within an educational context. The GFM is a learning organisation and we recognise the importance of sharing and we value learning from one another so that we can change attitudes and develop our outlook which will enable us to best serve those within our community. And our agenda at GFM Talks is to create a safe forum in which we can share, learn and or speak debate and or conversation. This afternoon we're going to hear from two colleagues. We're going to hear from Matt Dakem and Dan Stancliffe. Both Matt and Dan are currently completing a Master's in Sports Pedagogy with the University of Chichester and we're going to hear in two separate talks from both Matt and Dan and they're going to share the action research that they've been conducting as part of their Master's studies. So very shortly I'm going to hand over to Matt for the first talk this afternoon. The title of Matt's talk is Applying the Target Framework, Motivational Climate Theory and Education Pedagogy. In his talk, Matt is going to reflect on the realities of trying to encourage a mastery motivational climate in an educational setting. And in his talk, he's going to discuss his personal action research on the implementation of motivational climate theory to challenge ego orientated behaviours. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Matt for the first talk this afternoon. Right, so yeah, hello, um, I'm Ms. Dakem, just um, been asked to talk about uh, my master's studies that I've been conducting at Bay House uh, so far from last year. As you can see from the title, it's all about um, motivational climate, a bit of sp uh, psychology. Uh, obviously, for me as a PE teacher, it's going to be related to um, sports psychology mainly, but um, usually using this target framework and how I applied it in a school setting and kind of some implications it might have from a wider educational setting as well. So if I just start and move on to the first slide after looking at acknowledging this idea of ego or whether we're pursuing that knowledge. So the rationale, the background behind why I thought um, this would be um, worthwhile research to conduct at the school. Uh, there has been quite a few theories quite um, early on, about at least 20 years, um, looking into how we actually motivate ourselves to um, take part in any form of like education. So you've got the achievement goal theory and also the self-determination. This relates to anything, really, even general walks of life. Um, and it's kind of expanded into this thing from AIMS, which is about this mastery versus your ego and what actually orientates you to want to pursue knowledge. Uh, so the idea is either you are seeking that new knowledge or you're looking to better yourself slash or um, outperform other people. So what actually does drive you to improve? Does it come as a desire to better yourself individually? Or does it stem from this like need that you need to succeed over other people? Um, and as a result of that, what sort of impact does that have on your willingness to learn? And then whether that be obviously uh, outside of school, but what I'm looking at is inside of school setting. There is a general agreement that having this positive motivational climate, which we're looking at, it, increases that student satisfaction and skill development. All right? And it will help prevent those kind of like negative outcomes. However, not many people have actually looked at incorporating this within education physically and actually having a bit more detail about how it works in the realities of a classroom. Um, so just a bit of a background on um, why I chose it. So encouraging those mastery orientated um, climates is very, very popular in physical education settings, but it's not really been pursued inside a classroom. It's been very isolated, like interventions where they come into a school do two weeks and then they leave and they go, this is the results. Or they even take kids out of school to do it. So the context of a classroom has not really been studied. Therefore, we have big gaps in how students and how teachers actually influence them to create these mastery climates. Um, so the idea was I can bring this together to actually strengthen this and hopefully give a bit more context to how it can be implemented inside a classroom. So in summary, we know exactly that it can work, but we don't really know why it works or what it looks like. So to put a bit of context, so this is what a target lesson will look like. And obviously, this is something that other people can take away and go in and look in a bit more detail. But um, the non-bold kind of gives you what it would look like in terms of the activities or the setup of the classroom. 
Um, and then the bold, obviously, again, you've got a little bit more detail about how this is actually works. Uh, basically, the target is obviously broken down into task, authority, recognition, uh, recognition, sorry, and relationships, groups, evaluations, and time. Uh, these kind of six aspects can all be merged together to kind of create this kind of positive, um, personalized environment for students to learn. Uh, the main things you're looking at there is really trying to move away from segregating children and having children being able to identify who is in what sort of hierarchy in your classroom. So moving away from that and really kind of honing in on every student is personalized and has individualized activities and groups so that they can kind of all progress in their own sort of time without competition with other people. All right. So my outcomes for my research was to how do we effectively plan and deliver that? What does it look like? What do the students think about it? And how does it look like for me as a teacher as I was doing an investigation on myself? And then kind of reflecting how we can do this during a lesson and what the students uh, do with their interactions during that time. Uh, just to quickly kind of go over, I won't go into this too much detail. I had a, a questionnaire with the students pre and post uh, with a scale of one to five. Uh, they also gave me some feedback forms and I reflected myself of my own sort of field notes. And these are the ways that I kind of collected all of my data. A context on the class that I chose. Um, so I did it on one class over a unit of work um, and it was a quite a challenging year eight class. They were a top set boys class, very high able, uh, very specialized in the sense of PE that they were very football orientated and trying to get them to do other sports is quite difficult. Uh, I had taught them through year seven and eight for the majority, a couple of students only in year eight. It's halfway through the year. Uh, and they did engage in quite a lot of off-task behaviours and they weren't really keen on many activities that didn't involve, obviously, when we were doing unit work or football. Uh, there are lots of personality clashes as well. So this kind of had a reluctance for students to want to engage in the lessons and they had a really big, which is why I chose them, really big, I sensed an ego orientated that they wanted to be the best student in the class and they'd always, you know, slam down students that weren't doing very well. Uh, their behaviour kind of was challenging during a rugby unit of work that I did previously, just for some context that I was doing badminton this time, so moving from a team sport to an individual sport, which might make a bit more context in a minute. Uh, so, Fast forward, uh, the results from my pre and post from the questionnaire asked them a lot of uh, information about why they think um, they are behaving in a certain way. Uh, we're all looking at whether they go down towards answering it from a mastery or an ego, depending on what side of the scale they're on. There were really, really positive um, repercussions for an increase in this mastery so wanting to learn and better themselves. I had 11 out of the 12 questions in the questionnaire had a positive increase uh, however there was nine out of 14 also from the ego side that did increase from a negative perspective as well so it's an interesting to take away i've put in bold here just a bit of an explanation about each one of these and what they mean so if we look at the top and bottom one teacher approach to learning the desire to learn new skills these are the mastery ones primarily and the five out of six and the six out of six okay all improving now the main thing i highlight the third one right in the middle is that the worry against classmates and teachers, uh, that's the one that improved the, that improved negatively the most from that ego outset. So it kind of implies that maybe there might be students worrying about their mistakes would be the primary concern that they have as to why they encourage those ego outsets. Uh, these are all um, questions that had a positive impact, um, which from the questionnaire, so you can see that they had an increase of at least 0.5. Now, you bear in mind that we're on a Likert scale of one to five, and it was only over about a five week period. And 0.5 increases, you know, is quite quite a lot over that short period of time. A lot of these were about uh, teacher input as well. And then there was this one um, feeling most pleased when they mo when they managed to outperform others. So going in a bit more detail, just an interesting takeaway from that. Uh, so. This was a kind of a breakdown of how I took their student feedback. Uh, I'll go down a little bit more. Interestingly, a lot of students talked about how I actually interacted um, with them and how I care about their progress, which was um, not actually related directly to what the purpose of the study was. But it was interesting to note that they kind of really heavily took note of what I did not just what the students around them do as well. And overall, the students had a really good positive experience between what they had in the lesson and also links to their kind of questionnaire mastery output as well. 
So this kind of contradicts some of the master the um, questionnaire because the negative output. I didn't really get any negative feedback from those students saying that you know they wanted to just be better than everyone else. I had a lot of feedback um, about myself. Uh, hopefully, most of it was good and positive. How trying to encourage the students to try hard, you know, learn new skills, which is really important for that um, that mastery input. We've also got um, a lot of student learning. So how it's interesting for them to learn new things and try different stuff. Uh, and then again, this is the new bit of information that wasn't the primary um, resource, but it was quite interesting to get from the students about how I actually behaved and how they cared a lot about how, how I was in the class. So the idea of being calm, trying to be nice, persuasive, um, responsible for fun, like it was an interesting one, and how I actually behave and how that then in turn made them behave in that positive aspect. Uh, yeah, then links into kind of what I got from my own notes. So if we look down mainly at what the evidence showed in terms of the targets, I made a personal note that the tasks that they were doing, they really enjoyed and they engaged throughout the whole lesson, which was a big surprise to me based on the last unit of work and their experience with them. Um, giving them the authority to do their own tasks actually led to them engaging for a long period of time and actually had a big impact on... Um, on their teaching and on their learning they all were quite good at choosing whereabouts they were and what task was appropriate for them and they made quite good progress as a result of that uh, students responded really well to being given their own time to complete a task so for example some students were given you know tasks that they could move on to throughout the weeks whereas some students were still on similar tasks they were doing in week one as they moved into week three because that's just where they were at and that had a real big impact on actually their motivation. So they weren't being filled and like they were being pushed further than they needed to be. Uh, I had a huge reduction in disruptive behavior. Uh, this is um, a question to myself really at some point, whether it was mainly the target or just a change in the sporting environment. As I mentioned, we moved from rugby to badminton. And as it's an individual sport, it can maybe take away those competitive aspects that they are in those group settings. Uh, was strong at the start, the external engagement, and continued throughout the unit, which was really, really good to see. Um, one thing I did note was that the, uh, the students uh, were encouraged to do mixability as per the target framework, which did limit some of the progress to the high, high able students. And then as time went on, uh, students began to start comparing themselves to others. And they also were reluctant to work with the higher or lower able because they were like, mm, they're not they're not as good as me or I'm not as good as them. I don't want to play with them, which at the start wasn't an issue. But over time, it gradually crept up, crept up, regardless of how much I tried to avoid it. Uh, so then we can look at uh, basically the student outcomes. There was increasingly evident that competition and what they were doing as the weeks progressed did become more important to them. And they started to celebrate more. They started to be exposed to more competitive situations. Enthusiasm of students did kind of go down over time as students started to be more interested in beating other people than they were in necessarily better than themselves. So it's a note kind of how it, over time you need to be aware of what happens. And then comparisons to others at times when they are evaluating how good they were. Um, so moving on to actually what kind of context this has uh, going forwards, I honed down and looked at what actual impact it had on my pedagogy and the learning environment in the classroom. So the teacher, myself, um, maybe I'm blowing my own trumpet here, uh, had a nice, clear, positive effect on the attitude and interpretation. I think that's really important that basically my mannerisms and the way I interacted with those students was one of the biggest factors that encouraged them towards the mastery rather than the ego outcomes, because they basically like to replicate their teachers and they can potentially see them as their role models or people that they like to copy. And that's quite something you should recognise as a member of staff and when you're teaching your lessons. The teacher's desire to encourage those motivations should then impact how they then behave. Um, this ego orientation, I kind of recognise as evident when they were worrying about making mistakes. Um, the satisfaction of others recognised by students as undesirable. So it was mainly not necessarily that they didn't want to improve for their own benefit. It was that they were in fact worried about translating that to a performance in front of others, which is interesting to um, kind of take forward and how you can I can try and resolve that in your lessons. Uh, so <laughs> the competition did lead to some negative ego orientation. I've said it plenty of times, um, and it's just something worth reiterating. But from a PE perspective, um, 
I wouldn't say that this is necessarily a huge issue. It depends on how you are in your classroom. But competition for PE and in sport is inevitable. And by moving away from that and by taking competition completely out of your learning environment, there may be an element that actually you're taking some sort of drive to do better, whether it is for themselves. Um, because without competition, there isn't necessarily an aspect where you want to improve. Uh, so it was a bit of a strange one. I was kind of battling with my own ideology where I was not sure whether removing that competition actually did have a negative impact um, or a beneficial impact. It was a bit of a strange one. I couldn't quite figure that one out going forwards. But should they actually be restricted from a competitive environment and from feeling that excess over other people? Because that's inevitable. And especially there's always going to be a winner and a loser. Um, and if you don't expose them to that, is that then building up more of a negative impact in the future when they do eventually lose? Um, and then that link to comp competition having a correlation with that worry of mistakes the more competition you put in the more worried they are about making mistakes but the less competition you have maybe the less maybe the less willingness they are to actually engage and progress um and the last thing was for the pedagogy was how can we actually have an impact uh on different topics so did doing uh babington make a difference in comparison to having rugby, which was a completely different mindset and mind frame for a lot of students. So that's something to consider when you're delivering lessons. What am I doing and how does it impact a certain amount of students in front of me? So then lastly, uh, on the discussion, looking at how the actual target framework worked. So I kind of gathered from my information that the task and the authority and the time had the most meaningful impact. With all of those three, um, I would support that it's like this additive nature, which basically what Morgan says is that the target framework is not to be carbon copied and, and all incorporated at the same time. You can pick and choose which parts of the framework work for your classroom and which ones are better. So these were the three that I kind of identified as the best. Having tasks that were really varied and really differentiated to allow a huge like multidimensional activity, giving students authority about which activity they choose, and then also giving them enough time, whether that be over one lesson or multiple lessons, to actually get successful in that activity. Um, this had a real big impact on attitude to their progress. And over time, the kids were enjoying and it was clear that they were enjoying the lessons. And you can see that again with the feedback that I got and the questionnaires results as well. Uh, the recognition, <laughs> recognition and relationships and the grouping one. So this is the stuff I sort of struggled with personally uh, to implement consistently and successfully my relationships with students did come across as being very strong um and i did really try to make those individual recognitions and praises to those students which is in agreement with the research um however it was um it was quite challenging at times to make sure you got through the whole class and actually you didn't generalize feedback okay which is obviously what they dis dis discourage um and it was the most influential in terms of that how they perceive me and how um i perceive their their kind of progress. So this may be more valuable than recognition in terms of how we can how we can go forward with challenging uh, ourselves to not necessarily broaden the feedback that we get and actually to kind of personalize it. It's not always going to be possible, but trying to do it whenever we can. Um, I personally found that the grouping was quite difficult by doing that mixability, like I mentioned, didn't necessarily have a positive impact on my environment. And I Going forward, I must admit, it was one of the ones that I kind of removed from my um, from my teaching practice as it became really hard to kind of manage. And I don't think that the positive impact outweighed the kind of time and the commitment it came to doing that. Um, and then, yeah, so that's just something to bear in mind that you're weighing up, you know, the difficulties of implementing that and the actual success it will have on your um, class. So just to finish off, I'll basically conclude with, can the teacher be a person who makes a difference to this motivational climate? In short, absolutely. Okay, I think that the teachers are really influential about how the motivational climate works and you can give them all the activities in the world and they can be the most amazing. Uh, we're going to do self-discovery. We're going to really work on ourselves. But if you as a teacher don't strive and don't set that standard at the same time, I feel like it will fall on its face a little bit. So the structure and design did, yes, I had a noticeable change in the atmosphere. Um, and I believe that as a teacher applying it was successful in increasing that student mastery and they clearly had um, positive correlations between myself and the encouragement of those mastery attitudes um, 
And then just again to recap, focusing on those groups, mixed ability was difficult to apply. Competition, progress did have an impact. Um, and it's something to bear in mind when you start looking at um, how you implement this going forward. And it's really honing down on that support, that target framework, if you do t- uh, look into it in a little bit more detail. Um, it's really that additive attitude of don't implement it all at once. Some of it won't work. Okay, you might have to nitpick what works for your class and what works for you individually. And then having that idea about what sort of sports or from a, not any other classroom, what works in terms of the unit that you're doing and how you maybe have to adapt that. Uh, just really quickly about what I would do next. Um, this is what I'm looking to continue my studies as I look into my dissertation, how I can actually reflect on the learning and apply it either a longer time frame, so I can uh, analyse it over multiple sports, creating schemes of work based on the framework, uh, comparing more between the different types of settings that we have, so split, split mixed gender, mixed or set ability. Uh, and then I was interested actually into whether students in different subjects would display different mastery climates. You would make an inkling that they would, but it's really kind of figuring out why and whether the teachers have an impact on depending on what the, how they deliver in those subjects as to how the student interprets what the teacher wants from them. And then lastly, those guidelines, um, which actually haven't really been uh, developed much, uh, but some guidelines on actually how to implement this effectively in a generic educational setting. Um, hopefully that was um, interesting to uh, some of you. Feel free to get in contact if you wanted to learn a little bit more about Target Framework or wanted to get involved in any sort of research in the future. Thank you very much. The second of our talks this afternoon comes from Dan Stancliffe. The title of Dan's talk is Mentoring in Schools, Theory to Practice. I'm sure we'd all agree that a fundamental part of any teacher's career is those early years and in particular the training years. During the training years that's when we craft, uh, it's when we hone our craft and it's when we, we, we practice and we try out taking risk and we utilise different pedagogical techniques to meet the individual needs of our pupils and of course this is all done with the support of a mentor whose role it is to steer us in the right direction. Dan's going to share with us his piece of research where he's analysing the effectiveness of a mentoring of a mentor and it's actually himself implementing the GROW model of mentoring whilst mentoring a PGCE student teacher. So without further ado I'm going to hand over to Dan for our second talk this afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, just to introduce myself my name is Mr Sancliffe, I'm a PE teacher at Bayhouse School um, and I've been asked to discuss my uh, research project on mentoring in schools um, and taking it from the theory element uh, into practice. Um, a little background rationale, okay, um, the initial teacher training program, I think every, well, every teacher is going through right now, um, any trainee teacher, it's an aspect that develops our career and actually it could be the fundamental part of your teaching career. Um, this one year program or potentially the two year NQT program, um, the input that a mentor can have can shape your development. So I think it's a fundamental part of our careers um, and something interesting that I wanted to have a look at. Um, for this whole piece of research, okay, I use the definition of mentoring as helping support people to manage their own learning in order to maximize their potential, develop their skills, improve their performances, and become the person they want to be. Now, there isn't one uh, generic mentoring uh, definition. There are multiple, um, multiple things out there in current literature, but for me, this um, it may be because it's my personal philosophy, but I think this is the most suitable uh, definition I could find um, and wanted to use. Um, so just a background on actually the mention, there isn't a specific criteria of what a mentor should be. Um, using the University of Chichester as my mentor came from Chichester, um, the criteria is that you needed to have two years experience, um, so two years past and QT year. Um, you need to have a QTS or equivalent. Um, there were some university training lectures that you could attend, um, and there was a lot based on school judgment. So did the school think you'd be an appropriate mentor? Um, did they think you possessed the, the right characteristics? Um, that in itself, the experience could be uh, called upon. Um, should there be strict uh, criteria or, or guidelines of what, to, what makes a mentor? 
to improve, I guess, the profession? Um, or are people quite happy with um, with the school making judgment on who is appropriate? Now, uh, my research doesn't actually cover this, um, but it is something to note, uh, note down. Um, and also with the Gospel and Fair and Mold Academy of Trust, we are, well, I would say we have quite a lot of teachers that come through their initial teacher training year, whether it's through a school's direct or a PGCE, um, and they stay with the school. So actually, if we are keeping these, uh, these trainee teachers on, um, then I guess it's even more important that they get the right mentoring. So the role of the mentor, the mentoring process undertaken by training teachers is a three-way partnership between themselves, their mentor, and the university they are trained with. Um, I think this is a powerful, uh, powerful quote from Jones, Harris, and Miles, but actually the mentor, as well as whatever the university um, provide, as well as the school, okay, this is massive, okay? This little triangle that, um, that is created to support this one person is, I guess, their support network, their guidance. Um, I spoke here about the roles of the mentor. For me, a mentor offers experience, okay? And I guess that calls upon um, what was mentioned earlier, that actually they only need two years within the profession. Um, so it could be that they are still brand new to teaching um, and that can have its pros and cons. Um, they offer support for the mentor, um, both pedagogically, subject knowledge, um, also as somebody there for, uh, I guess, moral support, um, the mental health side of it. Okay, teaching can be tough. Um, initial teacher training can be daunting. So I do believe that your mentor needs to be there to support you where possible. Um, I did mention knowledge. Okay, they do need to have a good knowledge of um, pedagogical aspects, subject knowledge, they need to be able to give you advice, they need to be, give you guidance on how to improve. Um, and lastly, patience. Um, there's a few reasons for patience and um, we'll expand on one quite, uh, quite a lot in, in a second. Um, but having patience when we're working with our trainee teachers. We don't know what um, their current knowledge is when they come to us. Um, they're not going to be perfect straight away, so having patience, and for me, is a big aspect of being a mentor. Okay, so current literature, um, two ways that we can uh, mentor in my head. Um, the mentor-centered approach, which is considered the traditional approach, or the trainee-centered approach, and this is more the reformed approach, the newer the new approach, okay? So the mentor-centered approach, um, which has been uh, commonly used, like the traditional, is instructional from the expert, okay? The mentor is a fountain of knowledge. Um, the mentor knows best, uh, and the mentor tells the trainee teacher what they're supposed to do. Um, now, this has its pros and cons. Um, if the mentor is knowledgeable, they, they are... An, uh, an artist of their craft, um, then that's that's going to be beneficial. They're going to get the answers they want. They're going to get the ideas they want. Um, and rarely are they going to make mistakes. So from a mental-centered approach, there are, there are benefits. The trainee-centered approach, okay, the mentor is a facilitator. They are there to scaffold and they are there to support. Um, but the learner takes responsibility for their own development and they're reflective through discovery. So whereas a mentor said that approach, they are giving the information, they are telling you what to do, they are giving you the ideas, while the trainee said that approach, they are getting you to think. And there's a lot of research out there that suggests that exploring your own ideas and seeing what works and what doesn't um, is a lot more effective than being told what to do. If you get told to do everything that works first time, then you're just gonna be stuck with these ideas. Um, but if you have the chance to discover things that work for yourself, things that you prefer, um, then in my head, you're gonna have a better, uh, a better experience of this teacher training year. So for me, I've gone down a training centered approach. Um, I've tried to allow my student teacher to be the person that leads all the discussions to come up with ideas. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about how that went um, later on in the presentation. Okay, so 
I've explored about four or five different mentoring models. Okay, and this is um, this is the bulk of my piece of research. What mentoring model to adopt, and the benefits and I guess the downsides to the the model that I did I did actually use. So, like I said, I had about four four or five mentoring models um, for this presentation. I'm going to talk about two. Um, and the reasons why I chose um, the one I did. So this one is the De Developmental Medal, um, Clutterbuck 2004. Okay, so this, um, although I say a uh, symbol follow and this, uh, this little image doesn't look that easy, um, once you read up about it, it, it is quite simple to follow. So along the x-axis is the level of support. So one side of it, um, they are stretching you. So they are trying to make you uh, work harder. They're trying to push you. They're trying to get the best out of you. Um, and this links with that um, trainee-centered approach. They're trying to get you to think for yourself. On the other side, so the right-hand side over here, okay, we have nurturing. Nurturing is more giving them the answers, being there for them, and providing the information for them. Then on the y-axis, we have the level of responsibility. So directive, okay, once again, the, the mentor given all the information, given the tasks, um, setting goals, etc. Then on the bottom, we have non-directive. And this is where the trainee is there to think for themselves. Now, wherever you place yourself on here, so if you adopt a non-directive but nurturing um, nurturing approach where well, you're going to fall within this counseling category and likewise if you're directive but you want to stretch okay you're going to be in this coaching element now coaching is highly directive um it's mentor led and you're trying to stretch your trainee you're trying to make them think for themselves okay whereas counseling um they encourage ownership they want the the training teacher to, to think for themselves um, and they want them to listen to others as well. They want them to go look at other people in the department, uh, go find their own resources. Um, guiding, so top right, is similar to, to nurturing, um, but they have the solutions there. So there are four elements of, of this little model. Um, one of the downsides is I feel like it's a judge of personality. So you have to judge your, um, I guess you've got to judge your trainee and find out what they're probably going to respond to, or you're going to have to constantly be changing, um, changing what quadrant you are in um, to suit the mentor. So for me, I felt that was suited for a more experienced mentor. Um, so I, I declined it on, on that merit. Um, because I didn't think I'd be able to access all four um, where the, the training teacher needed it. The model that I did adopt was uh, called GROW, and it was by Alexandra. It's been dated in the 1980s. Alexandra, should I say. Um, not, there isn't a specific date that they can pinpoint this down to. Um, a lot of research had just got it into the 80s. Um, and what GROW actually stands for is goals, reality, opportunities, and what's next, okay? Um, Grant did state that this was the most effective model used in coaching uh, because it's simple in nature, it's easy to follow, and it's a step-by-step -step guide. So when you are conducting um, anything to do with your mentor, whether it's a meeting, observations, um, you just go for a step-by-step -step guide. So what are your goals? What's your reality? What are your opportunities? and what is next, okay? One downside is that they mentioned that the opportunity for reflection um, of the whole process, there wasn't much, much there. So uh, later on, they did add um, RE onto GROW, uh, two uh, further aspects of the GROW model, um, but that wasn't included in my study, so we are not going to delve into those. Okay, so before we move on, the training teacher was a PGC student from Titchester um, who had an outdoor adventures activities background, um, whose previous coaching experience came through rock climbing. So they had they had some experience of being in front of a class. Um, their background was through OAA, so not strictly um, the sports that are taught or the sport activities that are taught in school, 
um, but did have some uh, some coaching background. Um, me, myself, the mentor, I'm a third year teacher. Um, the first year mentoring, although I had had some training teachers in my classes, um, and I had previously went through the PVC with Chichester, um, so was familiar with their paperwork, um, what was required, and what the student teacher was going through. Now, the implementation of this GROW model. Um, so we had lesson observations, we had mental meetings, um, and this is where the, the GROW model comes into its element. So during the lesson observations, once a teacher delivers a lesson, a lot of well feedback should be given post the lesson. And now this might be immediately afterwards, it might be in the mental meeting, it could be at the end of the day when you have free time. But I ensured that the trainee led it. I'm sure that they developed the ideas of what went well, what were their strengths, what were their weaknesses, what they could have done differently, what really worked. And I felt that this was powerful, that they were the ones that, that generated these things. Now, this could, the lesson observation conversation, the feedback could be uh, related to the mental meetings that you've had. So it could be you have a mental meeting on a Thursday, and on the Friday, the lesson observations directly linked to what was spoken about in the mental meetings. The mental meetings um, is where GROW happens. So although you can talk about it in the lesson observations, I felt that in your mental meetings, um, this is where GROW gets planned. So G standing for goals. I think a lot of mentors out there, a lot of trainee teachers, they set what goals they want. Um, I think it's fundamental that we are asking them what they want to do, um, but they are the ones who set the goals. They are the ones that know what they need to improve. They are the ones that um, are there, I guess, their own destiny, trying to improve, trying to make it in a profession. So it's up to them to choose the goals. Now we move on to reality. Once we've set those goals, so it could be that they want to improve subject knowledge, it could be they want to improve the assessment, it could be they want to improve differentiation, whatever the standards are, we then have to talk about the reality. So where are they now? So it could be that subject knowledge is really poor and we have to discuss it and we have to talk about um, at what level they are. Do they know, well, when it comes to PE, do they know about specific topics? Do they understand um, different principles in PE? Uh, do they, are they aware of some sports and, and do not have, I guess, the subject knowledge for others? But it's important to understand where they are. Similar with assessment, similar with behavior management, what can they currently do? What are they confident with? Um, and what do they think they need help with? Understanding where they are is fundamental for the next two steps. So we've set our goals. We want to improve our behavior management. We then spoke that actually, I'm quite good at talking in front of a class, but when they are minor disruption, when they are kids talking, I struggle to get them to listen, okay? That's the reality of it. Now the O stands for opportunities. And once again, it'd be ideal that the, uh, the trainee teacher here generates the ideas so what opportunities do we have going forward so i've got a really disruptive year eight class okay this would be a great opportunity for me to improve my behavior management um, because they're always talking this is an opportunity for me to develop different strategies to make sure they listen it could be i have a really high able year seven class however there are three or four children that are slightly falling behind and this is a great opportunity for me to differentiate my activities to meet the needs of my learners. So once again, opportunities is highlighting areas that you can achieve your goals. Now W, the last stage is what next or way forward. So once you've identified your opportunities where you can succeed, you then have to come up with some solutions. Now I would recommend probably two, maybe three, different strategies. So it could be for, let's take disruption. It could be that you have a countdown. Five, four, three, two, one, okay? It could be that you have a warning system on the board. It could be that some children have to sit out, okay? Now, 
it, I, like I said, it's for the trainee to decide as I'm a trainee uh, approach. From there, you can then have a discussion of what's going to be best. I fully believe that they, with your guidance, should pick a strategy. It might fall in its face. It might work. But it gives them the chance to explore and reflect moving forward. If it falls on their face, then they're not going to try that again. Um, or they might try with a different class, still not have success, and they can just put that one away. It might be that it works really well, and they find that that works for them. But that mental meeting is, is, is very important um, to develop this GROW model. And from the GROW model, you can then have conversations throughout the week based on the goals, the reality, the opportunities, and the what next. So my final discussion, um, quite interesting actually. So the GROW. Um, so the goals ele element, okay, I felt my training teacher was very proactive in setting goals. Um, he was clear and defined areas for development. So he came in and was like, right, I want to improve my subject knowledge. I want to improve my behavior management. Um, I want to improve my assessment. But actually, I feel like my presence in front of a class is really good. One thing I did find with this, and I'm sure a lot of mentors out there um, would probably pick up on this anyway, there was a focus on one goal. So we set three goals a week um, as per the, the Chichester standards. Um, and he focused on one goal and said, right, I'm just going to look at behavior management. And that was his sole goal for every single um, lesson, which meant that the two other goals we had set sort of fell, fell away. We didn't really focus on them too much. Um, and off the back of that, we did have a conversation that goals could be class dependent. So when we had the opportunities, um, that O in grow, we spoke about actually, where could your behavior management, what lessons do we have to focus on your behavior management? Whereas the other two targets that we set, could we look at those being those tricky classes? Um, so very proactive, define the goals clearly, um, but maybe we needed to be a bit more specific um, and focus on them being class dependent. The reality, um, I'm going to start with a negative here. He was very self-critical. Um, now, I find that when you mentor, you will have two different types of people. You will have the people that are very confident in their own ability, um, and you'll have people that are, are self-critical either because they want to strive to be the best, or they don't want to come across as they know it all for people to think they're just being big-headed. Um, so my student teacher was very self-critical. So it was when we're doing the reality conversation, this took a lot longer because I needed to encourage him to be more positive. I needed him to, to see that actually you're not where you think you are. Your abilities are slightly higher than that. Because if I had his reality lower than it was, he would be striving to a place that he currently is and not making progress. So for me, getting this point correct, um, and I know that the universities used to have a bridging the gap uh, model uh, or a document where I did this, I'm not sure that still exists in the capacity it used to, um, but making sure that he was um, at the right level in terms of reality was important for us. And this led to an increase in confidence um, and increased awareness of his ability. So by me changing his, his thoughts, like I said, I let him discuss it first. So where do you think you are? By actually changing his opinion, it had an increase in confidence. It increased his awareness of his actual ability. Um, and I think that had massive implications of him moving forward. That actually he was aware that he could do it. Um, it was just some lessons that he needed to concentrate on it a bit more. The opportunities. Um, once again, let's start on the negative here because I think it links quite well. Um, the, so the trainees struggle to generate ideas, um, and that's a flaw for the GROW model in my eyes. Um, or we're using the GROW model with a trainee-led approach. If you, if you had a mentor-led approach, it'd probably work. 
Um, but using the grow model with this trainee led approach meant that I required him to develop opportunities. Um, he struggled to generate the ideas. He struggled to highlight where um, he could improve certain classes um, because of a, a lack of subject knowledge and a lack of pedagogical knowledge. Um, this then led me to try change the way uh, we use the model, um, which eventually led to us generating a plan of possibilities to choose from. Um, but this was a downside. And actually, our mental meeting, the, the allocated time, uh, we probably went over slightly most weeks trying to get this and this section correct. It also fails when opportunities haven't been generated. So once again, because we haven't developed the opportunities correctly um, through a lack of knowledge, okay, once again, the what next falls apart because of a lack of subject knowledge, because of a lack of pedagogical knowledge. Um, he struggled to, I guess, make suggestions of what we could go forward. Um, off the back of that, the trainee pr was proactive in selecting solutions once we developed them. Um, and then the discussions were generated based on the effectiveness on the, the options. So once he had the options in front of him, um, he was fantastic, saw the pros and cons um, before utilizing them, which meant that when it came to the lessons, they were more effective than um, anticipated. Um, but yeah, this is, once again, the opportunities and the what next needed a bit of a bit of assistance. Um, so on the whole, using this GROW model, um, I thought it was quite beneficial, the, especially the, the goals and the reality, understanding what we want to achieve and where we currently are, I think were very beneficial for my, my trainee teacher. It gave him something to strive for, um, it increased his confidence. He, he knew where he was. Um, allowing him to, to plan. Um, one thing, like I said, I found that a lack of knowledge hindered the last two uh, aspects of our GROW model, uh, which led, made me step in a bit more when I didn't want to. I wanted him to uh, generate ideas. I wanted him to come up with solutions. Um, I don't think it had an overall impact um, other than him just needing a bit more support and a, uh, a hand on the shoulder pointing him in the right direction. Moving forward, uh, I've got another. Um, I've got another trainee, or I had a trainee last year that we used um, before Christmas, and we've got one coming this time. I think it's going to be difficult with the situation we're in, uh, but it'd be interesting to see moving forward when school goes back to normal, um, the different types of trainee teachers that come in. Some might be a bit more confident, some might be a bit more knowledgeable, some might lack in confidence massively, um, and seeing how the grow model works. Um, similar to Mr. Dakin, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or set up a meeting. Um, it'd be quite interesting to see if this gets rolled out um, into the ITT team and suggestions moving forward for our teacher training programme. Thank you for listening. Many thanks to both Matt and Dan for the two talks this afternoon and for sharing with us the action research and their own personal reflections of their learning so far on their master studies. And I'm sure colleagues will join me in wishing Matt and Dan good luck with the remainder of their studies, in particular their dissertation module. Should you wish to submit any questions to Matt or Dan following um, the GFM talks tonight, then please complete the question submission Google form. Any questions submitted will be shared with the presenters to, answers, to answer. Colleagues can access the question submission Google form via the January 28th daily update, and the IOE will also make sure that the link to the Google, uh, to the question submission Google form is included in the uh, daily update on Friday, the 29th of January as well. So if you'd like to present at a future GFN talk, please send your details, the title of your talk, and a brief outline of the content of your talk to talks at gfmap.org, the email address that you can see on your screen, and Megan Webb will be in touch if we require any more details. Colleagues have the option of presenting a short talk for no longer than 20 minutes or time can be allocated for colleagues wishing to present a longer talk. So thanks once again to Matt and Dan for the two talks this afternoon. All that's left for me to say is have a good evening, stay, stay safe, stay well, and we look forward to welcoming you to the February GFM talks session. <laughs>